I want to share a story that might be familiar uh, to some of you, but my wife, Catherine, and I, we have been married now for 14 and a half years, which means we started dating 15 and a half years ago, which means I started trying to work it with her 16 and a half years ago. I know that's going to be hard to believe that there was actually a time when Catherine just wasn't that into this, and I know that's shocking but it's possible sometimes. So that was a reality at one point. And uh, I remember a time before Catherine and I started dating, before she was really uh, into this, that I was on the phone with Catherine. We were talking and somehow I got her to agree to watch a movie with me. And it caught me so off guard that she agreed to it that I got off the phone and I immediately snapped into action. Like I went and changed because I didn't want to just look fine. Like I wanted to look fine. And so I went and I changed and like, I made sure that my spike was spiky. I made sure that my shirt looked good. And I got in the car and I began to make my way over to Catherine's apartment in the whole way over there. I kid you not. I am just dreaming of what could be. I'm dreaming of what could be. I'm like, this is the Catherine Robinson. Like that is a big deal. People like the Catherine Robinson has agreed to watch a movie with me. So if this goes well, just maybe I can ask her out and take her out on a real day. Just think. And so I'm driving over and like I'm wiping my pitters and I'm gearing up for what is about to happen. And on the way over, I decide to call her and ask her if I can pick her up ice cream on the way over, just because it's subtle, but I wanted to just show her that I'm, I'm fun and thoughtful. And so I called her and asked her if she wanted any ice cream. And she informed me that she, in fact, did not want any ice cream. And she also let me know that she had invited her friend Katie to join us as well. <laughs> She's here tonight, by the way. Uh, Guys, that began a night-long lesson for me of learning that you have to be very clear up front with what your intentions are. So I made my way over to Catherine's apartment, and, uh, and then she spent the rest of the evening in the other room talking on the phone to a different guy who actually was calling to ask her out. The good news is that after she was done, us three girls were able to sit around (laughs) and debrief how it went. She hates it when I tell that story. But let me just tell you, like that night, my dreams in reality went in two totally different directions, people. My dreams and my reality went in two totally different directions. I went over to her apartment dreaming of being her man and I turned out to be her gal pal. Like that is how things played out for me. Like my dreams in reality went in two totally different directions and the end result was disappointment. Like I was extremely disappointed with how things played out and the disappointment, it it lasted for a day or two and then it kind of went away. But as I think about that scenario, and I just think about the last year, like here's the reality that there, there are times in life where our dreams and our reality go in two totally different directions. And the result isn't just a day or two of disappointment. It can be days, if not weeks, if not months, and even years of disappointment. If we are honest, what I'm describing applies to everyone's last year. Like the last year for everyone in this place, I can, it can be boiled down to this, your dreams of what 2020 and now the first half of 2021 would look like. Your dreams and your reality have gone in two totally different directions. That is everyone's story. What you thought 2020 and 2021 would look like is nothing close to what it has actually been. And life has been disappointing at some point for every single person in this place. That's just the reality. Like I have felt deep disappointment over the last year and I know that you have as well. Now, the good news is 
is many of us can feel like a shift is taking place. Like the vaccine is out, the university is, is opening up more and more, and, and it feels like things are getting closer and closer to what we want and hope them to be. And we're looking at fall 2021, and it feels like uh, life at Texas A&M will be even closer to normal. So as we begin to turn and, and look forward, before we move past the disappointment of this past year, I just want to make sure that we take a moment and reflect and look back and learn from it. Because whether you like it or not, pain can be a very good teacher and you can learn a lot from pain. And so before we move past the past year, I want to make sure that we right here at the end of the semester, look back and learn from it. If you've been with us at any point this semester, then you know that we have been journeying through the life of David. We have spent 11 weeks journeying through the life of David. I personally have loved the life of David because it's just so applicable to where we are all at in life. If you're with us at Family Weekend Breakaway, we looked at David's last recorded words. Tonight, we're going to look at David's last recorded song. Like, I don't know if you know this, but David was actually a songwriter. He wrote about 75 different songs. So the book of Psalms, in case you don't know, the book of Psalms in the Old Testament is just a collection of songs. And David wrote about 75 of them. And, and songs are a really powerful way to express emotions. And so one of the ways that David found to kind of just let his feelings out as he was a songwriter. And many of you in here, you've tried your hand at writing songs. That is how David would express himself. And so tonight we're going to look at his last recorded song and it's, and it's towards the end of his life. And what we're going to see is David look back upon the pain and the trials and the disappointment that he experienced in life. And as we see David reflect on his pain, we're actually going to be able to learn four things from it. And interestingly, the four things that we are going to learn from David reflecting on his trials and his pain are the four things that honestly we should learn from looking back on the last year living in the midst of a pandemic. And my hope is that these four things will be helpful. We need to learn now because here's the deal. The, the last year isn't the only season of disappointment you're going to experience in life. And so if we look back and learn, you can actually prepare your life and your heart for the next season of disappointment. Some of you heard me say we're turning the corner and you're like, I don't think so. Like I'm a senior and I'm graduating. I have no clue what I'm doing. And it scares the, the daylights out of me. And so you're looking and you already feel that disappointment of not knowing what is next for you. You're looking at the summer and you're like, oh my gosh, three and a half months. And, and I don't have anything locked down for the summer. And so you're dealing with the disappointment of that. So if if you're right in the midst of disappointment or living through a trial or pain right now, these four things are going to be crucial for you in it. So if you have a Bible, turn with me tonight to 2 Samuel chapter 22 as we look at David's last recorded song. And I'm going to give you four things that you need to know as you walk through pain and walk through trials. The first thing that we're going to learn from David is this. Bad things happen to God's people. And I hope I'm not blowing anyone's mind right now. That should sound pretty simple, but we have to start there. Let's just be clear. Number one, bad things happen to God's people. Listen to what, uh, listen to verse one. It says this. And David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. All that's telling us is that David had a large amount of enemies. And it just reminds us that there was a season of about 15 years where David had to live on the run from Saul. Like we've been journeying through the life of David and we've seen that man, David had a killer life. Like he was the greatest king that the nation of Israel ever saw. He had great fame. Like women wrote songs about David. 
He had tons of power. He ruled the most powerful nation in the world at the time. And at the same time, David lived through a lot of trials and a lot of pain. As I said, he lived on the run for the better part of 15 years because the outgoing king was trying to kill him. His, his best friend was killed at war. His daughter was raped. One of his sons betrayed him and, and took the throne from him. David had to bury four of his sons. Four of his sons died prematurely. He had to lead a nation through three years of famine. And on top of that, David had enemies that would just never really go away. David knew pain and he knew disappointment. I mean, look at verses five and six. Listen to what he says. There was a time in David's life when he didn't know if he was going to make it. He says this, for the waves of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. Do you hear what he's saying? There were times in David's life where he's like, I don't know if I'm going to make it. And just think about who's saying this. It's the guy who was labeled the man after God's own heart. What does that mean? To be the man after God's own heart? It means that he was all in with God. It means that whatever God wanted, that's what David wanted. Whatever God wanted done, David would do it. And yet he found himself in moments where he said, I don't know if I'm going to make it through this. And the only reason I start here is I just want to make sure that we uproot any weak or bad theology that might have lingered around, even living through a pandemic. The reality is bad things do, in fact, happen to God's people. Just make sure you don't confuse Christianity with karma. Karma says if you do good, good will come back around to you. If you do bad, then you can expect bad in your life. But Christianity, Jesus actually informed us that bad things do in fact happen to God's people. Listen to what Jesus told his closest followers, like the people who were all in with Jesus the most. Here's what Jesus looked them in the eyes and said. He said in John 16, 33, he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Here's what that means. Everything that you have experienced over the past year just confirms that Jesus was telling the truth and he can be trusted. Like trial should not shipwreck your faith. Trial should actually confirm your faith. Because when you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you're putting your trust in the one who said, do not expect to have your best life now. In this world, I promise you, you will have trouble, but take our, I've overcome the world. Don't expect your best life now. This is actually the closest. If you know Jesus, this is the closest you'll ever get to hell. And Jesus Christ is going to take us to a place where there's no more death, no more pain, no more tears. He is making all things new. But let's just make sure that we get through this pandemic with, with right thinking and good theology intact. Bad things do, in fact, happen to God's people. The second thing that we learn from David, and we should learn from the past year, is this. Trials are an opportunity for greater intimacy. Trials are actually an opportunity for greater intimacy. Here's why I say that. Trials actually give us the opportunity to change vantage points when we're looking at God. And trials allow us to see God and experience God in ways that we would never get to experience him if everything was just as it should be. Listen to how David talks about God in verses 2 through 4. Verse 2, he said... The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold in my refuge, my savior. You save me from violence. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. Do you see it in these three verses? There's eight different descriptions that David uses of God. What David's trials did was it gave him new vocabulary vocabulary related to God. It allowed David to see God in a, in a whole new way because David's life was unstable. 
because his life was unstable, he got to know God as a, as a rock. Just think about the images that come to mind when you hear the wording that David uses about God. He got to know God as a rock because David's life was vulnerable at times. He got to know God as a fortress and a stronghold, a shield and a refuge. Because he was in danger, he got to know God as a deliverer and as a savior. And did you see the word that showed up 11 times in these three verses? It's the two letter word, my. He is my rock. He is my stronghold. He is my refuge. It's, it's personal. God is really real to him because his trials were an opportunity for greater intimacy. Pastor and author Rick Warren says this. He says, you never know God is all you need until God is all you have. Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying, you never know. Like you will never know. It is impossible for you to know that God is all you need. You will never know that until God is all you have. What's he saying? He's saying trials are actually an opportunity. Pain actually opens the door to you beholding God in ways you'd never get to see him if everything was just okay. Follow me on this. Don't, don't miss what I'm telling you. Intimacy with God is the result of falling more in love with God's identity. Intimacy is the result of falling more in love with God's identity. And God's identity is revealed through his activity. So here's what I'm telling you. Intimacy with God comes from falling in love with who God is. It's knowing his identity. It's beholding his character. But God's character is revealed through his conduct. Who God is, is revealed by what he does. Trials are an opportunity for new activity. Trials are an opportunity for God to do something new in your life. Last week, if you were at Breakaway, uh, JP talked about uh, five things that you should look for in someone that you're going to marry. Let me just tell you this. Um, one of the keys to finding the person that you should marry and fall in love with is this. Like you should try and experience as many different circumstances and settings with a particular person as possible. Because the more circumstances and settings that you observe someone in, the more opportunities there are for you to see who they actually are. So when I was dating Catherine, I tried to put us in all sorts of circumstances and settings so that I could really figure out who Cat was. So we went to dinner a lot. And at dinner, Cat was funny and interesting and godly. But then on our second date, we had a, it really wasn't a date. Second time that we hang, hung out, it was, it was like a game night with friends and she was like dangerously competitive. Like terrifyingly competitive. It was interesting. I had to adjust because I was terrible at the game. <laughs> Scary. Anyway, uh, when we got around her best friends, she was joyful. When we got around her friends from work who weren't believers, she was kind and interested in them and full of integrity. When I was vulnerable with her about my past mistakes, she was full of grace. When I was looking for a job that might take me and us to a different city, she was encouraging and supportive and full of faith. See, different settings and circumstances became opportunities for me to see and experience who Kat truly was. I got to see her character. Her character was revealed through her conduct and it caused me to fall in love with her. That's the same with God. What trials do is they put you in new circumstances, in new settings for you to see God for who he truly is. Trials are an opportunity for you to experience God holding you in healing your broken heart in sustaining you when you don't know if you're going to make it. And I can tell you from personal experience, I know what it feels like to be held by God. And I know what it feels like for God to meet me in my pain and to heal my hurting heart. 
and I would have never chosen those circumstances. But now that I've been through them, I'd never trade them because I saw God in a way I never would have gotten to experience him if everything was as it should be. Trials are an opportunity for greater intimacy. The third thing we learn from David is this, God is working even when you are waiting. God is working even when you are waiting. You need to hear that. You need to believe that God is working even when you're waiting. See, our tendency is to evaluate God and judge God based on our limited perspective. And so we might see what's going on in our life or someone else's life, and we might conclude God isn't doing something. But what you have to remember is just because you can't see God doing something doesn't mean that God isn't doing something. See, God is working even when you are waiting. In the rest of the chapter, 51 verses, this last song by David, the rest of the chapter is just about God's activity in the midst of trial. So read with me. Like I'm, I'm just going to roll through and I'm just going to highlight a lot of God's activity. And I encourage you to write these things down. They're going to go pretty fast. I've identified seven different activities of God in trial. Don't freak out that I said seven. I promise you. Like, I'm, I'm really just going to list them, talk about them for one minute, and then we'll move on. Watch this. First, God hears. So just in case you're not following my order of things, we're on our third point. Okay. The third point is God is working even when you are waiting. And I'm telling you how God works when you're in the midst of waiting. Number one, God hears. Verse seven, David says this, in my distress, I called upon the Lord to my God. I called from his temple. He heard my voice. He heard my voice in my cry came to his ears. You see that? Like God hears you when you cry out to him. How's your prayer life been? during the pandemic because God hears you in the midst of your pain and trial. Second, God feels. God feels. Look at verse 8. Then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations of the heavens trembled and quaked because he was angry. What's that saying? It's saying that God was infuriated because of David's circumstances and because of David's enemies. Like God cares. He feels like think about the shortest verse in the entire Bible. Do you know what it says? Shortest verse. It's only two words. Jesus wept. And that was said about Jesus when he was mourning the loss of one of his best friends, Lazarus. Jesus wept. Like God feels when you're in pain, when you're in trial, God cares. The third thing that we see is that God acts like he takes action. Now, remember, guys, this is a song like this is poetry. So we see poetic language here. And I just want you to grasp how big David's view of God is, because that's what trials will do. If you lean into God, it will expand your view of him. Look at how he describes God. Verse eight again, it says, then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations of the heavens trembled and quaked. So this doesn't mean that the earth literally rocked and reeled. David's just, he's, he's talking about God moving and acting and displaying his power just for his one little life. His one little life with, with the trials that are going on in his life, he's like, man, when God began to move, it was like the heavens rocked and real. God began to move mountains. God began to flex in my life. Verse 9, listen to what he says. He says, smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. So that is... That is juxtaposed against what it says about David's cry to God. It's like, it's this one little small guy on this small little earth in this small little country crying out to God. No one can hear that. God hears. And yet when God responds, there is fire coming out of his mouth, glowing coals flamed forth from him. Watch this verse 10. He 
bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He was seen on the wings of the wind. He made darkness around him his canopy. Thick clouds, a gathering of water. Out of the brightness before him, coals of fire flamed forth. The Lord thundered from heaven and the Most High uttered his voice. He sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were laid bare at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. Do you see what David is saying? He's saying the all-powerful, almighty God, the one who can literally move mountains and command lightning was the one responding to my cries for help in the midst of my trials. Is that your understanding of God? If you're here tonight and you're an agnostic or you, you just don't know what you think about God. Like as I talk to people, do you know what one of the greatest struggles people have with the idea of God? You know what the great, one of the greatest struggles is? It's the problem of evil in the world. Because when people look at the problem of evil in this world, there's a couple of conclusions that people can come to. The first conclusion is that God has the power to do something about it, he just doesn't care to. And that makes him a monster because he could do something about it. He just chooses not to. The second conclusion is that God wants to do something about it. He just doesn't have the power to do something about it. And that makes him irrelevant and useless and incompetent and impotent. He can't help us at all if he wants to do something but can't. That's our circumstances. He's no different than us. The third conclusion is that God wants to do something about it. God has the power to do something about it. And God will do something about it. So wait and watch for him to move. Do you know why David prayed to God? He prayed because he was confident that God would hear him, that God cared about him, and that God would act on his behalf. See, prayer is actually, your prayer life is, is actually a great indicator of what your faith in God is like. If you don't pray much, it's probably because you're, you're not convinced of one of these things. You're not convinced either that God hears you, cares about you, or will do something about it. See, faith in a vibrant prayer life flows out of the conviction that God hears, cares, and acts. The fourth thing that we see God doing is that he rescues. Look at verses 17 through 20. It says, he sent from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. Watch this. He rescued me because he delighted in me. You see what David's saying? He's just saying, David, God, uh, David is saying God showed up when I was outmatched. See, God often does his best work in our toughest circumstances. God rescues. But you need to know sometimes God's rescue doesn't come nearly as soon as we would like for it to. And sometimes God's rescue is only sufficient for that day. And the reason I share that with you is because God has been at work rescuing you over the last year. And you hear me say that, and many of you say, I really can't look back and see the rescuing work of God in my life over the last year. And the reason that might be hard for you to see is because you're equating rescue with complete relief. That if God was truly going to rescue you, he would provide you with complete relief and complete comfort from all of your trials. But what I need you to realize is that every single one of us here has been outmatched in some way, shape, or form over the past year. We've been outmatched. There have been things that have been far out of our control, things that we can do nothing about. And for many of you over the past year, the past year has felt like hell for you. And yet you're still here. You're still here. And there's been times over the past year when you didn't know if you were going to make it. And yet you're here. 
and you might be barely standing, but you're standing. And you've had everything that you need to make it through every day since last March when everything changed. You know what that was? That was God's rescuing work in your life. That's what that was. That was God's rescuing work in your life. And did you see what the last part of verse 20 said? I love this. I just want to point this out. It says, he rescued me because he delighted in me. You know what trials are? Trials are an opportunity for God to show his delight in you. Isn't that amazing? Like God will actually, he never wastes pain. Like he actually will use your trials as an opportunity to show his delight in you. So anytime God does any work of rescue in your life, that is him showing his delight in you. So I just encourage you, think back over the last year. When has God shown his delight in you by giving you just what you need to make it through the day? God rewards. He rewards. And I need all eyes on me because I need you to know this right here. When I talk about God rewards, this is especially for those right now who are in the midst of the trial and you're trying to follow Jesus. See, when you follow Jesus and you live in trials for an extended period of time, it's easy to begin to wonder what's the point? Like, why would I pray or why would I continue to trust God when it doesn't feel like God is going to do anything about what is going on in my life? Like, I think about a pastor friend whose wife has been in chronic pain for years. Like, she has headaches that no doctor has been able to, to deal with. The strongest prescription pain medications that we have right now do nothing to take away the pain. She has been bedridden and she's around 40 years old. She has been bedridden for the last year. And part of me just wonders if they ever have reached a point where they're like, why pray anyway? Like why continue to trust God? Because it doesn't feel like God is doing anything. And David's message to you is hold on. Because God rewards. Listen to what he says in verses 21 through 25. He says, the Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He rewarded me for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God for all his rules were before me. And from his statutes, I did not turn aside. I was blameless before him and I kept myself from guilt. And the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his sight. What David is not saying is that I been perfect. He's just saying, I've followed God and God has rewarded me for that. Some of you just need to hear, do not lose heart in doing God. Uh, do not lose heart in doing good. God sees your faithfulness. God's rewards might not be immediate, but they will most certainly be eternal. God's rewards might not be immediate, but they will most certainly be eternal. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 through 18 says this. It says, therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. James puts it this way in verse Chapter 1, verse 12, he says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. I don't know who said it, but they said this, have eyes for eternity. Have eyes for eternity. God rewards. God also illuminates Verses 29 through 31 says, For you are my lamp, O Lord, and my God lightens my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He's a shield for all those who take refuge in him. Do you hear what David's saying? He's saying when the path seems pitch black, you turn a light on. When a troop of soldiers is coming at me, you... you empower me to go against them. When it feels like there's a brick wall in my way between me and joy, you cause me to leap over the wall. 
What's he saying? He's saying when it seems like there is no way, God makes a way. He illuminates. And God equips, verse 40, David says, For you equipped me with strength for the battle. You made those who rise against me sink under me. Do you know what this is saying? David's simply saying, God might not give you what you want, but he will most certainly give you what you need. And he will give it to you exactly when you need it. See, God is working even when you are waiting. Do not miss that. That is our third point. God is working even when you're waiting. And then the fourth thing that we learn from David, that we learn from this past year is this. Worship is the right response to a faithful God. Worship is the right response to a faithful God. When I say worship, I'm not just talking about what we just did where we sing songs to God. Worship can be that, and I would encourage you to reflect on the past year and sing songs to God. Get in your car, turn on some worship, and sing your heart out to him. Write your own songs like David did. Find a song for God in your heart. But it also might be sitting with him and just praying prayers of praise, thanking him for what he's done for you. It might be getting with some friends and just sharing about what God has done in your life over the past year. But worship is the right response to a faithful God. Listen to how David finishes his song. Verse 47, the Lord lives and blessed be my rock and exalted be my God, the rock of my salvation, the God who gave me vengeance and brought down peoples under me who brought me out from my enemies. You exalted me above those who rose against me. You delivered me from men of violence. So David begins to praise God and he recounts what God has done for him. And after recounting what God has done, he says this, for this, for all that he just mentioned God doing, for this, I will praise you, O Lord among the nations and sing praises to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. I'll just share personally. I want you to know the past year has been exhausting for me. Like I have never had a harder year of leadership and ministry than the past year. There were times in leadership over the past year where I could not see the path forward. And there were times that were just deeply disappointing and exhausting. And even today, as I was thinking about sharing this with you, I just stopped everything that I was doing. And I just began to reflect on the past year. And I began to worship the Lord in that moment, just praying prayers of praise, thanking God, because as I looked back with perspective, I saw all the ways that God provided for me and equipped me and rescued me. I saw the work of God, even when I couldn't see what he was doing, even in the waiting, just because I couldn't see God doing something, it didn't mean God wasn't doing something. I could look back and see his movement. And my response was worship. I encourage you to do the same. So how do we respond to a message like this? Let me just encourage you with three things. Number one, before you leave tonight, worship the Lord for who he is and what he's done. Like when we sing in a moment, sing your heart out to him. If you want to sit and just pray prayers of praise to him, do it. And then when you get home tonight, I encourage you sit with a friend or as you're walking home with your roommate, whatever it is, I encourage you to recount all that God has done in your life over the past year. Share it with one another. And then the third thing is this. Every day this week, let me just challenge you. Take your troubles to God in prayer. Believe that he hears, that he cares, and that he will act. Take your troubles to God in prayer every single day and thank him for what he is already doing about them. And then I would just want to close tonight and say this. If you're here tonight or you're watching online and you do not know Jesus Christ, then my hope tonight is that you would know Jesus Christ as your rock and as your refuge and as your stronghold, as as the one that David proclaims at the beginning of his song, that you would know that, that Jesus is is all of those things. See, we're, we're coming, we're on the back end of a, of a pandemic right now, but you need to know you were born into a pandemic, a spiritual pandemic. 
a pandemic of sin that every single person on the planet has been affected by, that every single one of us is a sinner, meaning that every single one of us has lived contrary to God's ways. Not one of us has lived the life that God requires. And what we deserve for not living a life that God requires is what we deserve is his wrath and his judgment, not his love. And yet everything that David just mentioned about God is true of Jesus. I want you to know that Jesus Christ hears. Romans 10, 13 says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. When you call out to God, asking him to save you from your sin, he hears you and responds. Jesus feels. Matthew 9, 36 says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus Christ left heaven and came to earth filled with compassion for you and for me because we were separated by, from God by our sin. Jesus Christ acts and he rescues. 1 Timothy 1, 15 says, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to do what? To save sinners. That's why Jesus Christ came was to save us. Jesus Christ went to the cross and he was punished for us. He was put in a tomb and then walked out of it victoriously. He did all of that so that when we turn from our sin and look to him in faith, he saves us. He rewards. Hebrews eleven six says, and without faith, it is impossible to please him for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Do you hear it? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. What God requires is that you number one, believe that he exists, but that you also believe that he rewards those who seek him, rewards us with eternal life. He illuminates, Romans 8, 14, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. When Jesus saves you, he supplies you with his Spirit. His Spirit, God himself, lives inside of you and begins to lead you. And then Jesus equips, 2 Peter 1, 3, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. Jesus saves you. And then he begins to lead you and he gives you everything you need to live a life that glorifies God and brings you wholeness. Do you know him? If not, if not the invitation to you tonight is to come.